Well, we'll start. Let's tell, we, we, we already had the introduction to Tom, so we'll get started. Once again, Keith Ku, a managing partner of Guardian Insight Group. I am an angel investor, but I also work in mentor startups operationally. I have a radio show that's in its fifth season called Silicon Valley Insider, but right now it's going to be Dubai Insider because as this is my second time in the region, I'm learning more and more. One third of my shows are actually on crypto and blockchain, and the reason why, similar to Tom, is I've been in the space since 2013, but as the managing director of technology risk for MUFG, the Bank of Tokyo, similar to Tom, I owned AML and BSA and KYC. It was something that we looked at academically. It wasn't anything we could actually touch at the time. And Bitcoin was about $250 a token at that time. So I should have quit and I should have jumped in. So um, blockchain for business. Vanessa and Tom actually did a really perfect tee up because usually, who in this room still, can you be honest, who still associates blockchain with cryptocurrency? Raise your hand. This is good. Two months ago at the last conference, there are far more hands up. So the underpinnings of crypto or Bitcoin is blockchain as a technology. The technology behind that's what we want to talk about today. So what I want to do is uh, we have a very large panel. I want each of the panelists to do a brief introduction to themselves. And then we're going to go next to, hello, Suhail, welcome back. And we have uh, Suhail Ahmad also joining us. Um, we'll have each of the panelists give an introduction, less than one minute, please, because of the size of the panel. And then we're going to talk about some real world use cases for blockchain. So, Suhail, you're up. Great. And you can probably share microphones. There you go. Great. Thank you, Keith. Um, so, a brief uh, introduction. Um, I'm originally from Canada, based in Scotland now, uh, representing Qatar. And uh, so, I've been in uh, the blockchain space, or I've been a champion of blockchain since 2015. And, um, and one of the things that uh, you know, we're really looking at is DeFi and the applications of blockchain for real world problems. Um, and you know, crypto is just the first use case of blockchain, but there is opportunity for us to be able to um, really look at uh, how we can apply blockchain. And that's what I'm really interested in discussing here. Thank you. Hi, uh, it's Kurt Overly. Um, for our family office right now, our focus is really on, uh, on the blockchain. And by that, we don't mean crypto. Uh, we really have no interest in being long various cryptocurrencies. We think there's tremendous event risk that is not priced in. Um, you, Tether is going to collapse at some point. There's, there's a, the climate and right trial. And there's all kinds of things that people just aren't paying attention to. So. So, but we are really excited about the opportunities um, for real-world applications for blockchain technology. We're making investments in companies that are um, engaged with supply chain management software, uh, triple entry accounting, uh, connectivity and monetization of the Internet of Things, um, which, which is really only enabled by things like uh, micropayments, which allow data packets to be monetized. So. That's, that's what we're looking for. Awesome. Uh, I'm Dean Thomas, Global Head of Institutional Capital at Polygon, which is a 10 to $15 billion protocol. I'm also an angel investor and venture investor in early stage blockchain projects. Former Goldman Sachs and Blackstone private equity, so uh, came from the traditional finance world into blockchain. Hi, my name is Clark Varen. I'm an American, but my business is in Uganda. And I'm most interested in the application of blockchain in emerging markets, especially when it comes to financial inclusion. So I have a microfinance institution in Uganda. It's what I like to call a centralized microfinance institution. And I'll be talking a little bit more about my idea for a decentralized microfinance institution where you have a community-led program with its own governance structure run on the blockchain with complete transparency. And um, I believe that with this type of solution, it could be something that completely revolutionizes the way that people in emerging markets that want to start a business or, or whatnot access capital. Uh, my, name, my name is Ryan Moore, uh, Pheasant Resource Partners and the Pheasant Companies. Uh, we are focused, we've spent over the last several years um, stepping on, on technology and blockchain. Um, in somewhat of a go-forward basis on uh, a number of different ways to manage smart contracts, manage um, title issues, and those are some of the things that we'll be talking about today. I'll be talking. 
Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Raj Bagadi, founder and CEO at Scallop. Uh, we are based in uh, London, UK. We are a one-stop solution for both uh, crypto and uh, banking services. Um, our aim is to bridge the gap between the traditional finance uh, users and also the cryptocurrency users so that they can easily on-ramp and off-ramp between fiat and cryptocurrency. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Daniel Kirk. Salam alaikum. Uh, I'm an American uh, with European parents, so a uh, dual citizen. Uh, I'm with GeoBitMine, sitting in for Jay Jorgensen. I'm the COO. Uh, I've been involved with crypto uh, currencies in particular since uh, 2017 and started mining um, back then. But I have about 15 years in uh, smart city projects, everything from uh, smart wearables to smart homes to smart buildings, telecommunications infrastructure, and uh, have, have a strong interest in seeing uh, where blockchain can take things that were previously intangibles and bring those into um, uh, you know, advanced uh, markets and exchanges, things like uh, carbon credits and seeing things like in the emerging world. I've spent quite a bit of time in the southern hemisphere. Um, and uh, really feel like blockchain can, can do things like, um, uh, you know, opening up, opening up the opportunity for these like carbon exchanges and so forth to get funds to um, encourage and incentivize people across the globe to not, you know, cut down rainforests and actually get revenue from, from that in exchanges. I've seen, I've also worked on other projects with uh, blockchain and bringing that to real estate at uh, an institutional level and working with, uh, individuals in some of the large exchanges in the, the U.S. to try and get um, uh, that going. Happy to be here. Hello, uh, my name is Miloš Markovic. I'm a managing partner of Branded Real Estate Holding. Uh, we are a European uh, EU company with offices uh, in EU, uh, Lisbon, but also uh, here in Dubai because I'm, I'm living here. This is my home and also in uh, Miami in the USA. We are basically, as we discussed uh, yesterday on the, on the panels, we are uh, branded real estate uh, holding developers for the branded real estates, but in the same time trying to basically introduce uh, the, our project and to connect with the blockchain and to make a referral a utility token that is linked uh, with us, but with the aim to make it as a referral for the real estate. Hi, my name is Tom McMurrin. I'm the uh, CEO of CMDX. Uh, we're a kind of a, a rewards company for people that want to get healthier, uh, get wealthier, getting healthier. And uh, author of the Seventh Disruption: The Rise of the Di Digital Currency Billionaire. We've already done that. So the revised book is uh, The Rise of the Digital Currency Trillionaire. I think we'll see that within the next five years. I'm excited about the timing. Uh, we spend a lot of time you know, educating people on how to do cryptocurrency transactions still. Only 5% of the world has probably done one. So that means we have a long way to go. And I think uh, by 2023, we should see the tipping point where everybody's starting to, you know, do transactions with blockchain and where it's not about money, but the assets of my house, my cars, my self-driving car, all of the, the wealth that I have in my life will be consolidated onto the blockchain, and that's the kind of value I'll be transferring. But I'm so excited about the space. I, I think that the rewards element of crypto and blockchain is probably one of the best use cases out there. Uh, my goal is to get one of these airlines to introduce a blockchain-based cryptocurrency miles program. As much as I'm flying lately, I'd love to see my miles go up in value like Bitcoin did. So excited to be on the panel with you. And I would just say if we take all those introductions and put it into one person, uh, we, we would create the next trillion dollar fund. Amazing. It's an exceptional point, Tom. Yes. And I would just say that when I actually explain crypto to some people, and the differences, I actually used the frequent flyer miles as a perfect example of that. And uh, I wanted to do one more introduction, which is Richard. Richard Zhang, CEO of Strat Mines. I've done the introduction a couple of times today. So I'll just say that uh, one of our funds focuses on Web3 aspects, primarily from the perspective of next generation commerce, next generation transactions, and the metaverse, and the juxtaposition of the three. Uh, at the risk of being scandalous, I think if you combine all of it, we may cancel each other out. Um, and uh, although there is a lot of concerns about how crypto volatility uh, is, is in itself scandalous, we think that if it moves like this and it keeps going up, the down and up almost doesn't matter. It's like swimming in the, the ocean. So we think that it's okay. In fact, we started with the crypto hodling 
and now you are primarily investing in platforms like exchanges, marketplaces, and so forth. We hope that they will become smart enough, like Mr. Thomas here, at some point to start going straight into protocols. <laughs> All right, with all the introductions, I want to thank everyone. Um, and again, this is a very large panel, so everyone's going to get about 90 seconds to two minutes max. But do your best to not use a crypto use case. What is your favorite blockchain use case that crypto could be a byproduct of, but what's the actual use case itself? And I'm going to start with Richard. For us, the favorite part is the transaction, not transaction of value alone, but also transaction around identities. Because we think that the uh, Web2 side of the world, the tr legacy internet, really struggles with this, these two particular parts quite tremendously. Right now, I think one of the things that we're looking at is um, you know, micropayments. And a use case and a project that we're working on is looking at royalty payments. You know, how can we actually uh, not just uh, verify, but also make royalty payments on a monthly basis, um, as well as revenue sharing agreements to provide alternative financing for SMEs, uh, non-equity based financing using blockchain um, as the trustless uh, ecosystem, right? And I think micropayments is a hu uh, you know, an enormous use case for blockchain um, that people don't really seem to pay attention to because it's almost zero transaction costs. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna second the motion. So uh, yeah, I think that uh, one of the key unappreciated uh, aspects of blockchain is the, is the introduction of the ability to make really real micropayments. Um, because this, I, guess, I think coming back to a point that Tom raised in one of his earlier talks, what the internet got wrong is that information is, the internet does not actually monetize information but micropayments for the first time and really allow information at a very basic level to be, to be profitably monetized. And as a specific use case, I'll give you an example. So one of the companies that we're invested in is called Unisot, which stands for Universal Source of Truth. They're building a supply chain management system for the Norwegian fishing industry. Part of what's key for that so that they can track things like sustainability, origin province, from hatchery to table, is again having a universal source of truth, but a key part of that is to be able to plug into the internet of things, to do things like monitor uh, temperature conditions for, for the fish as they're being shipped. And the only way that that really works is if you properly incentivize the device makers to, to pay for their data, and micropayments enable that. Great example. Dean. Yeah, I think um, just more broadly, I think the really cool thing about blockchain, cryptocurrency, Web3 is be, be basically they're creating a lot of things that we all naturally want and things that if you think about it, you're like, it doesn't make sense the way it currently operates. So for example, they talk about micropayments. It doesn't really make sense why you can't wire somebody money Saturday and Sunday, right? It just because the bank's closed. And so if, as you imagine, if I'm here, I'm like, hey, I want to pay you something, but the only way I can transfer money is wiring if it's a larger amount. I have to wait until Monday. In those three days, like I talk about this all the time, a month in crypto is like a year in traditional finance. So in those three days, you could have lost out on probably 30 different deals. That could be 50 Xers over the next 12 months, right? So in that process, um, we have a desire, right, as human beings, to be like, hey, I want this to be more efficient, this is a pain point, I want to fix it. And so things like USDC transfers, UST, all these things that are coming out, solve those problems, right? And so anything as small as micropayments, anything as big as play to earn gaming, um, identity, um, DeFi, like all these things are pain points that we all experience in our day-to-day -day experience in traditional finance. And by using smart contracts, blockchain, these new technologies, they're solving and innovating new ways to basically make it easier to transact and to create the things that we want to create. So I'm um, very excited and optimistic about kind of the technology overall. Yeah, Dean, uh, several years ago I had heard from a startup, and I know it's more now, but to transmit money from the United States to Sub-Saharan Africa, if you can even get to it, is about 23% in fees-ish. And I think that your point is well taken that uh, the Technology can be very transformative for these unreached locations. Now you have to get electricity to get mobility to them, but that's a great use case. Yeah, so it, the real benefit of blockchain is that it increases trust and transparency, right? So what I'm really excited about is in a place like Sub-Saharan Africa or Uganda where my business is, where investors don't really trust me when I say, or not just me, but they, they just don't trust uh, the industry 
when we say like, hey, microloans have really good repayment rates. So I currently have a centralized microfinance institution in Uganda, uh, but we can't access these really far off farmers, for example. And what they do in order to like self bank themselves is they create savings and credit cooperatives, which are called SACOs. And those are like decentralized microfinance institutions. So a decentralized microfinance institution is where each person puts their own savings into the middle like pot, and then from that pot of money in the middle, they'll end up giving microloans to one person in the community each week, for example. Now, the UN talks about this as this could be a really amazing way for us to you know, eradicate poverty in places that are really hard to reach areas, because farmers in distant places will do that. But it's really hard for these people to access capital, because banks and other investors and whatnot don't trust whether or not they're going to be able to pay back. But if you had a blockchain-based portfolio management software that shows them, hey, these, these people are paying on time, and you can see the exact portfolio at risk, then that would be able to open up affordable debt into those places where right now people have no other alternative to capital. So at the end of the day, I think that one of the coolest you know, applications of trust and transparency is how can you trust someone that's out in the, in the middle of uh, you know, the, the countryside of Uganda and trust them that you could give them a microloan without ever having met that person before. So that, that's what I'm most excited about in this industry. I think it could be one of the most life-changing or world-changing applications ever. Thanks, Clark. Ryan? Yeah, so from our perspective, from the traditional energy space, uh, one of our major problems that we have is, is tidal, right? And so, and, and it stretches into real estate as well. And if we could actually get everything set up on blockchain, go through tidal, you know, in the U.S., mineral rights are severed in most cases, and in a lot of cases from, uh, from the surface rights. And so, and then they're fractionalized and sold off in pieces in a lot of different cases. And so what we would really like to see is that we can start to establish that, have it on blockchain. We're not having to chase down, you know, the mom and pop transaction that was done and never filed and having to go in and, and do a lot of different things that, that, you know, we handle through a number of different systems. But, you know, we can automate this process. And then beyond that, from a transactional standpoint, we'll be able to reach out to the people, be able to set up a smart contract if they're interested in the offer, it's done, and it's automated. And to speak to both of y'all's points, you know, it's a great, it can be done on the weekend, it can be done, you know, and, and you don't have to meet that person, you don't have to know that person, and the trust is there, because you can just go back, check the chain, and, and, and it's done. So, so, so Ryan, I'm going to follow up with that, and uh, perfect use case is title registration, but in the U.S. there's regulations and laws in the way of that. Uh, Natalia Kirianeva is a good friend of mine who did the first title registration on blockchain in, in um, I believe it was Romania. And she just actually NFT'd that property a couple months ago. I was actually on that, uh, aware of that. So I wanted to ask you, before we keep going to BK, is what's your solution? Is it going to be jurisdictions that are more friendly, crypto or blockchain friendly, than those established markets? Yeah, I think it's going to, I mean, it's just going to have to take time for adoption, right? I think that's the biggest thing. Um, it, I don't know that until the industry accepts it as... Uh, the standard. I don't know that you're ever going to have enough of a connection for it to work, but you know, I think if you get everybody kind of on board and moving in that direction, I think that it, I think it'd be great. You know. Thanks, Ryan. BK. Yeah. Um, so if you talk about blockchain use cases, I think even the whole day is not enough to be honest. Because if you want to perform an action effectively, quickly, uh, blockchain is the best solution. I mean, as our panel, the panel members mentioned, uh, a lot of issues can be resolved through blockchain use cases. For example, yes, my you know. My, Flying miles, you know, collecting miles, you know, points through flying, and not only the, for example, COVID certificates and COVID passes, PCR tests. I mean, we can save paper, put it on a blockchain, where you know, authorized authorities can access them to blockchain, and then they can verify it through the documents. I mean, 
everything can be done through blockchain. There are a lot of use cases. Of course, the first and foremost thing is in financial sector, especially sending funds from one country to the country effectively, quickly, at lesser rates. You know, and of course, trust is always there. So blockchain's main uh, use cases are in financial sector. You know, getting um, DeFi into the mainstream use because uh, today I think uh, uh, five years ago uh, when we, I mean, uh, when, when cryptocurrency came in place, I mean, a lot of people are like, hey, you know, it's that it's scam or blah blah blah. Don't trust. But the trust and transparency is always existed. And afterwards, uh, cryptocurrency moved into the financial sector, which is DeFi. I mean, one year ago, DeFi total value locked is around only 30 billion. Today, at this point of time, it's 1.1 trillion money locked in DeFi. So people are adopting it. And once a lot of, I mean, as uh, our colleague mentioned, it's just 5% right now doing single transactions. When people, more people start using it, the more adoption comes in, and then countries will start implementing the regulations as well. And we will see that happening very soon. Thanks, Vicky. Dan. I remember watching an interview with Steve Jobs when the iPad first came out, and somebody had asked him, well, what is it for? And he iPad said, or iPod? Sorry? iPad or iPod? You ha or what's that? I was just clarifying, iPad or iPod? iPad, Got the it. iPad specifically, because they were looking at it and said, okay, well, what's it for? And he said, I don't know. He said, I, I made it, it's up for other people to figure out what the utility is, and it goes back to what was said at the, uh, at the beginning, that it's kind of a solution looking for a problem, right? And what we've seen now is that you have these, these savvy individuals, right, many of which are sitting on this stage and in the audience that are now seeing the, the vision and what it can do and how these things can apply, and you were right, that if we could sit here and talk all day about what are all the applications that blockchain as a technology can, can do to solve uh, real world problems. And I have many aspirational ones, but my favorite one that's, that I've seen actually kind of getting out there is um, it, it has to do with, uh, with real estate in particular. And how um, uh, Tom had mentioned that there's a lot of middlemen, like intermediaries that are going to be replaced essentially, right? Uh, accountants were, were one of those, but we see real estate uh, agents as well. That's one where, you know, there's an there's a incredible amount of profit to be made in real estate. And what would be neat for me to see is, as this becomes adopted, is that the lion's share of those profits being pushed down to, to, to your common man, right? That's able to put a little bit of cash into, with liquidity, right? And some of these really long-term projects that go for like 10 years with these big commercial real estate projects, right? That somebody with a lot of money can wait that out. Well, now you can have the liquidity for some of those things that people can kind of go in and participate in that and push those profits and I don't want to use the politically charged term redistribute, re redistribution of wealth, but it, it allows for that for people, you know, you bypass banks, you bypass um, some of these commercial real estate entities and get those profits down to, to your everyman person. And that's, that's going to be exciting to see. Thanks. Milos. <clears throat> the, the useful, in my opinion, the usefulness of the uh, blockchain simply doesn't stop uh, with the cryptocurrency. Definitely not. And if an idea of the blockchain is a secure, safe, immutable record makes sense to all of us, then uh, we can see uh, basically a lot of applications that are not related to the uh, cryptocurrencies uh, in the real life. And I definitely would like to speak about real estate because this is what we are doing. But because of the humanity, I, I can say also that uh, we will see if not today, in the nearest future, also the healthcare sector, where the blockchain will uh, represent and have a significant uh, part of, of, of it as a secure transfer of data. Then we will, we will see, if not today, very soon also in the food processing. So those are applications that are not related to the cryptocurrencies that I see that uh, has a future of the blockchain. Although I like the real estate because this is what yeah. we are doing, but we will see also in other uh, applications uh, as well. Thanks very much, Tom. So to be careful, I would say that data is the new oil, as they said in the Economist magazine. And I, I would like to capture all the data that's been everybody. I see all on your phones, and I'm like, wow, the amount of data that's being generated in here and. Uh, from our wearable tech and our shoes and our garments and, and all the, the data that we're creating. I, I think when you look at the existing infrastructure that's in place and the way we handle data, I don't know if it's as much about a redistribution of wealth, it's a recapturing of wealth, of wealth that in, you know, anybody will be able to have. But I think when we look at this model, it's gonna be, we're, ta we're talking about universal basic data income, uh, forget UBI, you can give money to people and they'll just blow it, they have no value, but when they exchange energy for value, it's a whole nother deal. 
And so when I exchange my exercise for data or, or for money, or when I exchange uh, you know, my filling out a health questionnaire like we, we ask them to do with our company, that's an exchange of energy for value. And that's where I think blockchain shines. But we look at the core principles of blockchain that we've talked about transparency, we've talked about provenance of the data, we can track it all the way back to the very beginning. There's so many powerful principal elements of blockchain that it can be really applied to just about any industry. And if you have a corporation or you run an event like this, the, the Rotosa Family Office Summit, you could literally create a blockchain out of thin air, or create a currency out of thin air and influence people to stay in the big room or to not be out in the hall or to, you know, to exchange or meet with the investor contacts or whatever. So I think one of the, the greatest influences of, of blockchain is, is obviously capturing the data, but also influencing customer behaviors uh, like an airline. Like I said, I, I would love to have frequent flyer miles that uh, went up in value like Bitcoin. I could travel the world for free. But uh, I, I think uh, it's going to affect every industry, but I think the rewards category is being broadly overlooked. Um, I'd like to see more corporations come out with blockchain-based incentive programs to reward their customer for behaviors that make them more profitable and more efficient and uh, you know, more open. Thanks, everyone. And I, I, just to wrap this segment up uh, and finishing, as much as I love all the use cases, I'm going to talk about Milos and Tom at the end of this was that data and incentive and reward systems. Um, my feeling about that also, all these are important, but is the securitization of the identity because you're getting very powerful amounts of data when they know everything about you, your wearables, as you mentioned, Tom. Um, you will get everything data mined. And so that's why I think on top of all this is the opportunity done properly is the AI and ethics behind that. Also knowing that jurisdictionally we have differences in standards of AI and ethics so that you can actually per blockchain, per use case, program that in for the jurisdiction that you're in. So uh, I think that's great. I wanna, with the, we have actually 13 minutes left, so I wanna do this because I think it'll be enough time. I'd like to each of the guests, starting with Tom and going this way, is what is your personal passion? So we talked about the use cases. Uh, non-crypto, what is your personal vision for where this is heading in the next five years, short time frame? So what is this heading in the next five years, starting with you, Tom? Well, we talk about, I mean, the macros that are happening, you know, the smartphones are going to drop below 30 bucks a piece to manufacture. So you'll be getting a free smartphone in your box of Frosted Flakes. You know, the corporations are going to be giving away these data collection devices. So we're going to see, I think, a lot more smartphones in the hands of 3 billion people. We're going to see Starlink giving internet coverage. It took 50 years to get 3 billion people online. In the next five to seven years, another 3 billion people are going to come online. That's going to connect everybody. Everybody's going to get a smartphone. That smartphone's going to have a wallet on it. Everybody's going to become their own bank. There's going to be a trust protocol. Everybody's going to be interconnected. People are going to be able to get microfinance loans. Like I said, for my friend, uh, you know, Efine over here, I'll be able to get a micro loan from him to finance my business, whatever. But it's, it's going to be amazing when we see the evolution. But I think the finance industry is going to get backdoored. And if they don't pay attention, uh, people doing microfinance projects, people laying that infrastructure, all of a sudden it's just going to pop one day and there's going to be an $80 trillion market looking us in the face, and that wealth is going to lift people out of poverty. But I think, as Don Tapscott said and Patrick Burns said, this technology holds the promise to lift more people out of poverty than any technology in history, and I think that's what we need to focus on right now is, is really helping the world from that, that, that humanity aspect. Thanks, Tom. English. Absolutely the, the same opinion I have uh, precisely. Uh, as much as the internet was revolutionary, so we, all of us was, you know, now we can track some data and find some basic data on the internet. And the, in the same way, the blockchain is revolutionary, but, but not only in the financing, as I, I, as I said previously, I think that the usage of the blockchain will be much more than in the finance industry. We will have it on the common cases like uh, healthcare, like food processing. And yes, we, we all will have the smartphones, like now we have uh, iPhones or some, uh, some, some others, where we will have connect, uh, everything uh, connected. Is it finance? Is it our uh, healthcare status? Is it what we are, uh, how diet we are going to have and how it's going to be tracked, even the communications, and everything is in the, in the protocols. So if we have the safe, uh, immutable protocol of, of the uh, transactions, then 
the blockchain is uh, everywhere uh, around us. And how the time will passing, we will see much more applications all around uh, us in, any spa, in, in absolutely any aspects of our lives. All right, Dan. Yeah, I, I don't know if this will ne actually happen in five years, but uh, um, I, I think this is a kind of a, a really like the sociologists, you know, dream, right? There's all this data pouring in. They've never had so much data that they could utilize to kind of predict human behavior and maybe then even influence it. Right, based on that, based on that knowledge. But what I really like to, what I would really like to see, and what I, where I kind of see this going, is a disruption of old power structures. And I don't mean just government, right? I mean things like when you introduce things like transparency, as as was being talked about, into into things like microfinancing, you're disrupting old power structures like fear, right? Fear and, and an inability to see what um, what people is, are doing with your money and what you're putting your money into, and that is powerful. There, when you start, when you're able to decentralize you know, from a power structure and then make it transparent. Now you're talking about really changing and, and bringing not just like, I have a little bit of a, a skeptical optimism, I think is what uh, Mr. John was saying. I have a little bit of bit that myself, but that's what makes me so excited about what blockchain can do because I find that disrupting within myself as well. Well, I can see the transactions. It's a immutable ledger that's right there in front of me. I can see what's going on, and that to me is exciting, and that is what I hope to, to see. Maybe not in five years, like so, I so said. So Dan, but, and when we yeah. go back to Riyadh, we should probably talk about DAOs, but we don't have time for that now, but great. Right, sure. So BK, over to you. Yeah, anyway, that's, that's what I'm looking forward to. Coming to, I mean, my, my passion is like, you know, uh, we need to bridge the gap between the traditional finance people and the um, blockchain and cryptocurrency industry. For example, here we have a lot of, uh, I, mean, I mean, we have so many family offices here, but a lot of people still, you know, uh, having this fear of cryptocurrency blockchain. You know, why? Because of these three factors. First of all, is pure regulations. Second thing is that, you know, the, the problems of uh, the resources and the knowledge, the experts in the blockchain, they don't have, they don't have enough knowledge how this will work and everything. So if these kind of things are resolved, you know, uh, there will be a bridge between these two. Uh, I come from a financial background as well, and, uh, and all these uh, uh, cryptocurrency, uh, you know, we were talking about 1.2 trillion, 1 trillion, all this has to be banked at some point of time. Um, so I'm looking forward uh, maybe in one or two years, there will be a, a pure regulation comes in place where traditional finance people and cryptocurrency people, you know, come together to one place, and uh, there will be a constant flow between these two sectors. Yeah. Got it. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, I would go with the, uh, I'd go with the decentralization, right? I think that that's the the biggest thing that I think that we'll see moved over this over the next five years, because I think people are tired of, especially in the U.S., poor decisions, great decisions, however you want to spin it, as far as how the government spends your money, right? And I think that, at least from my perspective, you're taking a lot of that out of con out of their control, and you're giving it back to end user, beginning user, and end user. And I think that I think that that's going to be the big shift in the short term. Thanks, Clark. I think that uh, one of the most hyped up things that blockchain has completely failed at is banking the unbanked. And one of the reasons why is because transaction fees are ridiculously expensive and ridiculously slow. And the, the big limitation behind blockchain is that it's linear. You know, one block builds off of the next block, builds off of the next block. You can only be building one block at a time. And so one of the most exciting projects that I've heard about is actually a post-blockchain solution. It's called a DAG. And it's kind of like a blockchain solution, but instead of building one block at a time, it builds like a waterfall where it kind of like trickles down. Multiple blocks can be built off, uh, off each other at once. And then the blocks will recategorize into uh, different regions, so you're not, when you look through the blockchain, you don't have to look through the entire chain to find what you're looking for. You only have to look through relevant blocks. And that can dramatically uh, reduce the amount of time that it takes for a transaction to go through or any other information to process. And it, it'll make transaction fees really, really, really cheap. And once you have a solution that is fast and cheap, that's when things like microloans, micropayments really become a reality. Until that happens, it's not a reality. Thanks, Dean. So this is a broader um, technological realization that I, I had recently, or not recently, but I'm slowly becoming uh, more aware that it's almost a certainty. So 
If anybody here has watched the Neuralink video with the monkey, you know, playing, uh, have you seen this, the Pong video, where he's playing it, and halfway through the video, they tell you that the control is actually not plugged in. He's just thinking those thoughts, and through machine learning, basically, he's controlling this, this external object, right? So all of us, as we're, whether we're aware of it or not, we're all cyborgs at this point, right? We're no longer just like biological human beings. We're connected through the web, through blockchain, through all these things. And slowly we are moving from the physical towards the non-physical, whether it's digital assets, whether it's shopping, whether it's anything. So like beforehand, you would have to physically go to like a store and buy something. Now I can think a thought, type something into Amazon, and the thing will arrive at my house in two days. In the future, right, within the next five years, give it 10, uh, just to be safe, I think all of us, whether we like it or not, will have to be embedded with Neuralink or some type of technology like this, because it's gonna be the equivalent of not having a smartphone in today's day. So like, imagine if you were to operate in today's society with like a paper map and being like, hey, I need to get from Ritosa to the airport, how do I get there, right? It's like, it's almost laughable. But if you were to try and compete in a business sense or any realistic sense, it's almost impossible without a smartphone. And so from that perspective, if it, it's, not, it's not like I want to be chipped up, it's not like I desire to be, it's like if you don't do it, everyone else does, you basically get left behind and you can't really operate in, in that sense. So it's gonna be a brave new world for sure. I think it's like even now, like from the moment I wake up until the moment I go to bed, right? Like Telegram, uh, you know, Instagram, WhatsApp, email, like it, it's like you're already virtually communicating with everybody through kind of these so, technologies. So Dean, another mind blowing topic we'll do for another session. But yeah, thanks. yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But basically like within the next five to 10 years, no, like without a doubt in my mind, we're all gonna be much more cyborgs than we already are today. And the question then becomes, how do we elevate overall human consciousness to use that technology for good? Because you'll be capable of a lot of things that are seemingly godlike now. And the question is, with that democratization of technology in everybody's hands, what do you do with it? And how ought people act? And how do you give people a higher level of consciousness so that they act in a way that is beneficial to society, not destructive? Good, got it, thanks, Kurt. I'll be super brief. The next big thing is the metaverse and its associated virtual economy. Um, it's going to be, uh, there's a reason why Facebook renamed itself, and they're, they're right. I don't think they're gonna win, by the way, because of, frankly, because of blockchain, uh, because I think the blockchain technologies are going to enable it, but that's a, that's a topic for a different panel. Yeah, thanks, Kurt. So, yeah. All right, um, well, yes, what my passion is, so my passion is FinTech, and where I see the real use case for blockchain over the next five years is being able to democratize access to capital uh, and investing. So why is it that my friends at Sequoia can get access to certain deals that you and I you know, struggle to get access to? And the blockchain can do that as well as for the venture industry being able to uh, provide access to capital without the, the bias and the accessibility. Thanks, and Richard. For us, I think there are, there are two things. One is unassailable ownership, not just the assets, but your own identity without some entities having to back you up, saying, yes, you're Richard, because government of the United States of America says so. Rather, I am me, and I stay on the blockchain. And uh, along with it comes the ownership. The second part is the automation to a different degree. We've been looking at all kinds of automation and AI investments, but pushing the automation at the organizational level is pretty tough, because you still need a central system. Uh, in fact, one of my partners actually setting up the charity, uh, which tends to leak about 50% toward administration and fundraising and so forth, with a lot of people running behind it, into a DAO, uh, distributed autonomous uh, organization. And when you look at something like that, I think eventually maybe even family office, venture fund, private equity fund, and even corporate organizations could pos possibly get to the point of a, a smart contract-based organization like that, that resolve a lot of the things that we don't like to do. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, we're out of time. I want to thank again my panelists, which is Richard Suhail, Kurt, Dean, Clark, Ryan, BK, Dan, Milosh, and Tom. I think we've got, for Vanessa and Sir Anthony, for our next conference, at least four more panels we can run. Um, again, I'm Keith Koo, Silicon Valley Insider and Managing Party Guardian Insight Group, and thanks again.